Welcome to Faith and Culture Now. Today, my guest is Ross Worthy. Ross, it's great to have you here. I'm very happy to be here. So what we're going to be doing today is talking with you about just how to engage music from a Christian perspective. But before we do, I want to say Ross does some podcasting, and he is a musician. And you can find some of his music up on Spotify now, uh, as well as probably some other places, but that's what I mm -hmm. listen to. So. Uh, and um, you also do a podcast called The Blood Orange Project. Do you want to tell a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, the music, you can find the music at a, a Red Arrow on, on every streaming platform. Uh, and The Blood Orange Project is something I started uh, after having a season of life that was very dramatic. Traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, my, I had very briefly I had flown to Seattle uh, to meet my dad for the first time uh, in 2000, in December 2016. In May 2017, he died. Mm -hmm. And then Wednesday of the same week, one of my close childhood friends uh, attempted suicide. And then on Friday of the same week, my aunt, whom I was very close to, died of brain cancer. And uh, it was very, I, to that point, I had really never lost anyone I was really close to. Yeah, yeah, and that's a lot real quickly and to, it's, it's, to process it's, and everything. What was even more odd about the experience was it was a lot all at once, and I had never processed something similar to that before, mm -hmm. and I, ne I didn't feel the same way for each of the three people that I had just had this experience with. Mm -hmm. And that was, that made things worse because I felt like a bad person because I wasn't as sad about my dad. Sad wasn't the right word for mm -hmm. my dad, but that was the right word for my aunt. Mm -hmm. um, so it was weird, and yeah, sure. and uh, I started. I found myself in coffee shops and just around doing my regular thing, working and and having to do go back to normal life, but not feeling normal. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, in passing by, some people would say, you know, how are you? Just at a coffee shop, casually, stranger, mm -hmm. and I started being honest. Normally, you say I'm fine, I'm good, sure. or whatever. Yeah, I'm doing great. I okay. started to be honest and and not like say I I'm not doing well. And some people would sit down and talk, mm -hmm. and and we would just talk. And through those conversations, I realized there's a lot of people who, have, by all accounts, live a normal life, but are living with something that is very hard mm -hmm. um, and so I started a podcast where I, I tell my own stories and I invite people to come and tell stories from their life that maybe they've never had the opportunity to share in a long form conversation mm -hmm. and I've talked to, to people who who struggled with meth addiction I talked to uh, I talked to a guy who shared the story of sitting with next to his wife uh, while she is on the toilet in their house miscarrying their child and mm -hmm. what that was like and uh, you know, I I got to interview someone I went to school with who I thought uh, she she was an incredible she still is an incredible person but mm -hmm. never in a million years would I think she would become addicted to opiates mm -hmm. and uh, she did and recently mm -hmm. and she shared her story in a two part conversation and it was just amazing so yeah. that's what that is the Blood Orange Project is just where I talk with people and you know, we talk openly about the parts of their life that don't normally get shared. Yeah, uh, it's very therapeutic, I'm sure, for you yeah. to talk with them. It's probably very ther ther therapeutic for them to talk with you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, really good, really yeah. good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do uh, just other other things I do. Uh, I started a new one. So the Blood Orange Project's with people, and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm keeping it like that. Uh, I started another one called the 10 Minute, uh, called 10 Minutes Together, and it's a 10 minute podcast where it's, mm, the Blood Orange Project isn't necessarily religious. I, mm -hmm. I've interviewed people who, who would not consider themselves religious, yeah. who do not consider themselves Christian or anything else. Uh, but 10 Minutes Together is, is my time to sort of share how I think faith interacts with the rest of my life and, and, and culture and reality and imagination and politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I and do so. It's almost a devotional style. It's just yeah. ten minutes. That's the other thing. But the the other one I do is called the music show, mm -hmm. and I do it with my wife. Uh, we write music together, 
and uh, th it's essentially a radio show, but I specifically feature um, music from artists you probably have never heard of. And, uh, and we also only feature music from artists we can get permission from, mm -hmm. which kind of works together, because if you've never heard of them, they're probably not very big, which means they're pretty reachable. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that's what we do, that's a lot of fun. Uh, we release episodes every 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 week, and uh, so if you're if you want to hear some new music you've probably never heard before, you can check that out on all those platforms as well. Yeah. And there's a lot of really great musicians out there that are not big, yeah. who are releasing really wonderful stuff, but they don't get any radio play. And so mm -hmm. if you don't find them through something like this, uh, or through lots of research on your own, you don't find them at all. Yeah. And so it, it is a really great opportunity for people to hear some really good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's a lot of fun. And believe it or not, we featured one of the artists. His name's Daniel Romano. Um, I think he, he has, I mean, he's not very big. He's a, he's a full-time musician, so in mm -hmm. some ways he's kind of made it, I guess. Yeah, sure. If you can, if you can work yeah. as a musician without having another job, right? You've you're made doing it. pretty good, yeah. Uh, but I think, I, and I just found him stumbling across some stuff, and uh, and I think he's my favorite artist mm -hmm. it, alive, um, and and he's small, and so something like that can happen to yeah. you. Just you just not you just don't know what's out there. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Well, and speaking of the music show and and listening to fun, innovative new artists. Um, what I want to start today with, with talking about music and Christianity, uh, is just a little bit about why it's important to engage the arts. And um, I think that my theory is that we should look at art as a conversation and not simply as something to turn our mind off to and escape from, uh, basically escape from reality into the art. Uh, it is good to get lost in a story, but it's not good to stop thinking as you go through the story. And you find stories in pictures, you find stories in sculptures, you find stories on television and movies, you also find stories in music. And so uh, but the way I see Christians looking at music is not to go, oh that person's singing a song I don't agree with, I'm just going to shut them out. Or that artist lives in a way I don't agree with, I'm not going to listen to their stuff. Instead you look at their songs and you go, okay what is this person trying to say? And how should I uh, interpret what they're trying to say from a Christian perspective, how should I understand it, how can I converse with it in my own head to make me a better person, and how can I use what they're saying to help me understand better the world around me and the culture around me. So my, uh, my theory basically is that we engage art by looking at the message and then going, okay, this is a good perspective on this. Do I agree with it? Do I not agree with it? Do I agree with parts of it? And, and so on and so on. So what are your thoughts on some of that? Yeah, so um, I, there was a time before I actually moved, moved to Dallas mm -hmm. when I started to, well, I had become a Christian and then I took a whole, whole year between a junior college I was in and then moving here, studying with my pastor at my church. And I was in a time where uh, I thought that listening to non Ex not explicitly Christian music was probably not good for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of had that position. Um, and it wasn't until I'm, I, and I, you know, it's kind of like the whole, like, I was saying that and, I, and part of me like really thought, yeah, this, this must be true, but I still, mm -hmm. but I, I still listen to to the radio, and I that I didn't take it super seriously. It was more like a thought I was I was marinating mm -hmm. on. Um, but I had people all around me who who were very committed to that. Yeah. Uh, in my church, to you know, and not and I'm not talking about for for people listening. Like I'm not talking about I'm talking about people my age. Mm -hmm. um, I came to Criswell and I was in some classes, and what I found out through some of my classes with Dr. Spencer, with Dr. Graham was the reason I thought that is because I just had never I had never understood how I'm supposed to listen to in this case to music mm -hmm. and what I assumed and what I think a lot of people think in in our in sort of our circle is um, music is like a sermon 
Mm -hmm. and, and what is being said is something that you need to make, you need to take and make a part of your moral mm -hmm. framework. Sure. Um, which is so not, <laughs> that is so not uh, what that should be, but that's sort of how it comes how yeah, it comes across that how way. How it comes across, and yeah. and so you so then it makes sense. Well, I'll only listen to music that explicitly talks about worshiping God, or talks about a specific, a unique situation that would only be relevant to a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, there was even a time when I went to Doctor Spencer's office, kind of when all this was happening, when I was realizing, oh, I just have never understood how to interpret art, how to receive art. Mm -hmm. um, about that time, I went to Dr. Spencer's office and I'm a guitar player mm -hmm. um, and my friends can't believe this happened, but it actually happened. I told him I was thinking about stop being playing music mm -hmm. because of, it was a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And I could be out like witnessing to people. Yeah. And, uh, and I was serious. Because I was like, what am I doing this for? Like, I can play music in church, but I don't need to be wasting my time practicing at this. And he just looked at me all sober like he is, you know. And he said, if you stopped, if you stopped playing guitar, that would be a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh. And then that's when all the things I had started to sort of hear in his class, here with Dr. Graham, Mm -hmm. started to sort of come together by him telling me that yeah and the value in artists taking a skill that few people have to have developed mm -hmm. uh, and then not only having a skill and developing a skill but having sort of the giftedness of creating music and lyrics out of out of nothing mm -hmm and bringing some sort of truth uh, to life, whether or not it's explicitly, and that's sort of a false dichotomy, mm -hmm. whether or not it's Christian. that It's sort mm -hmm. of a false dichotomy um, because true things, beautiful things, belong to God. Yeah, all truth is God's truth. Yeah. All beauty is God's beauty. Yes, yeah. and that can even come, that can be revealed in artists or songs that maybe weren't written by or performed by Christians. Mm -hmm. Like things that are true and beautiful can be said or articulated or created by people who don't, who may not realize the depth of the th truth they're trying to say. Yeah. Uh, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book called Art in the Bible. It's a really good book. Um, it's only about 70 pages, so it's easy for people to get through and read, uh, read quickly. He talks about five kinds of artists. He says, you know, there are artists who are believers, who know God's truth, understand that, and reveal it in their work. There are artists who are believers, who don't know God's truth, and even though they're Christian artists, don't always reveal God's truth in their work. Um, you also have artists who are not believers, who don't reveal God's truth in their work. And then you have artists who are not believers, who sometimes, in fact, do reveal God's truth in their work. And um, what he's making the point of is that whether you're a believer or not, you can present truth uh, in your art or you can uh, forego presenting truth in your art depending on whether or not your thinking is in alignment with the truth that God has revealed in Scripture and in the world around us through nature. Mm -hmm. um, he also talks a lot about um, the value of art in his book, but one of the things I would say is that I think music is probably the most powerful form of art in the history of the world. And uh, I don't say that just because it's my favorite. I mean, it is my favorite, so I am biased. But um, I think that the reason music is so incredibly powerful is because it is one of the most long-lasting forms of art that we have. But it's facilitated, uh, it facilitates worship in religious ceremonies. It's in elevators, it's in stores, it's in your car, it's on your iPad or iPod or whatever else it is you're listening to. And uh, basically, it's just so pervasive that everywhere we go, there is music. I mean, um, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, there's a lot of movies that don't have soundtracks. And you watch those, and you're just like, oh my goodness, why, why are we watching this as it is? 
And um, once people started putting soundtracks on films, it revolutionized even the movie industry so much so that a movie without a soundtrack today isn't really even considered a movie at all. Mm -hmm. So well, there's a sort of a there's sort of a magic that happens that music has. Uh, there's I see a lot of similarities in theater and mm -hmm. music. Sure. Um, Major, that's why there's musical theater because mm -hmm. they go together so well. But uh, music can say things that often cannot be said other ways. Yeah. Uh, or, or maybe you you can verbatim say something in a monologue, and then you pair that you you change the monologue to having a melody, and and have the music carrying that melody, and it mm -hmm. it's different. Mm -hmm. I mean, ev anyone can see that. It oh, yeah. affects you. Or you can take some lyrics out of a song that you love, and if you just read them off the page, it, it doesn't punch you in the same way. Mm -hmm. that, maybe not the best metaphor, but it doesn't impact you yeah. in the same way. And then I would say another amazing part of music is, in, in a live setting, it's one of the few mediums, uh, or me forms of media, that is never... It will it will never happen that way again. Mm -hmm. If you're watching a live concert, you'll never hear that song that way ever again. Yeah. And there's a special moment in that, but that's just my. I heard the Rolling Stones guitar player Ronnie Wood. Uh, he's he's been with them since the '60s, and this was probably in 2015 or 16. Somebody asked him, "Why do you guys, as the Rolling Stones, still go out and perform?" And he says, "We still think we can do it a little bit better." And we just, every time we get on stage, we want to try to do it just a little bit better. But uh, if you've ever watched, you know, uh, a band and you listen to their live albums, every single time you see them play the song, it's just a little bit different, you know. Yeah. It doesn't always sound the exact same way it does on yeah. the CD or mm -hmm. on the uh, MP3 file. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to something you said about talking about different people, illustrating truth, people uh, who do not align themselves with any kind of faith, delivering truth, and then those not writing music, creating art, but it's not truth. Uh, I, I still think, so an, another misconception is listening to, there is only one way to listen to music, mm -hmm. and, and it is casually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can listen to music casually, but when I say things like, you should you should listen to the artists who you know are not saying something you agree with, mm -hmm. um, or maybe it's maybe it's explicit, or maybe it's or maybe there's something surrounding this artist that is controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, you should you should listen to their music, not casually, not because you are endorsing the message, but because mm -hmm. that's a way. To me, that's a way to look in a unique way into their personality or their life and thing that surrounds them yeah. or their worldview that you wouldn't get maybe just even having a conversation with them. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it just expands your ability to relate to them. Even though they're saying they're talking about things that it's unfamiliar to you, it's not something that you would even agree with. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's still art and it's still a creation, and it's still he's still telling you something, yeah, uh, or she is still and telling you, you something. You look at all the songs about heartbreak out there, and they're all different songs from different perspectives about the same topic, and they reveal how different people emotionally react and. Um, cope with feelings of heartbreak and uh, loneliness and things of that nature. Uh, if you take, say, the example of domestic abuse, there's a lot of songs out there that deal with domestic abuse. Uh, I mean, there are blues singers that sing about domestic abuse dating back at least the 1930s yeah. uh, with, I mean, famous songs, you know, and then you have uh, stuff dealing with domestic abuse in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, and so you, you listen to different songs about this particular topic and you're getting different artist perspectives on how to deal with it and mm -hmm. how we should think about it as a culture and what we should do about it. And um, there's, there's a lot there. And you're not going to agree with everybody. Mm -hmm. 
but you're going to go, oh, I hadn't thought about that before, and or it you're expands gonna, your knowledge. Yeah, or you're going to hear someone, you know, wailing over this blues song. Uh, there's a, oh man, what's her name? Coco Taylor? Coco Taylor? Coco Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, Insane Asylum. Mm -hmm. That song, Insane Asylum, it's a blues song from maybe the 60s or something like that. Um, the wailing of her voice. Mm -hmm. is in, is enough to where you don't even need to know the words. You can just hear the the anxiety mm -hmm. uh, that she's bringing to the to the music, and that alone yeah. stirs you to. To me, it stirs my affection to to in songs like that and blues music, which I love blues music. Um, to hear the the desperation or the the circumstance. Um, and to me, that's captivating. That's that that makes me want to make myself a, mm -hmm. just it's talking practically. It makes me want to make myself available to to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, even though I know they're far away and or not alive. Yeah. But um, I can hear as a Christian. Maybe here's the application: is mm -hmm. when I hear someone, there's no answer in their song, and I don't know, and I don't necessarily think there should be always. Mm -hmm. But I, I I hear my own commitment to my to this faith to to Christianity, causing me to say to be sensitive to that anguish. Yeah. Well, and you make a connection with the artist yeah. and what they're singing, and you know when people go to the concert and they sing along, there's an additional level of connection, and yeah. you know you feel like you're participating in the art with the artist as you sing along, but you're also feeling like this is something that we both relate to and there's a sense of community in mm -hmm. that. Um, a number of years ago I was leading a youth retreat and um, there was a time where I did some question and answer with some of the teenagers and one of the girls who was there asked me why you would ever even want to listen to music that wasn't about God and my response was you listen to music about every topic because God created humanity in His image, and as such, God is interested in every aspect of the human life. Well, I would say too, unfortunately, mm -hmm. typically, the music not about God that's produced today mm -hmm. is often more honest. Yeah, in some respects. Uh, I find contemporary a lot, not all, I would find a lot of contemporary Christian music very shallow. Mm -hmm. It's it, They all say the same thing. It's all, and even the music itself is so not interesting. It's not technically excellent. It's not, yeah, and it's not technically excellent, but it's it's also not really unique. There's no, there's not, it's just sort of, they found a pocket mm -hmm. to market. Yeah, uh, themselves to a very particular audience, and they're sticking with the framework. But the lyrics, even in the music, are just very shallow. And mm -hmm. and if you if you read this through the Psalms or you read through any book of the Bible, it is a deep and complicated mm -hmm. and and messy and messy and yes and messy and not clear mm -hmm. and there are not answers always. I heard Bono uh, from U2 a few years ago in an interview talking about uh, Christian music today and he said how come there aren't a lot of Christian musicians out there talking about their horrible marriages or you know trying to keep their marriage from falling apart. Was this with Eugene know? Peterson? I believe it was. Yeah so, I love that. Uh, and uh, his whole idea you know his whole thought in, in the interview was that Christian artists need to be brutally honest mm -hmm. and not always come across like we've got it all together or yeah. like um, you know you just pray about it and th then it's all happy again you know it, you know sometimes in the Christian life God walks with us through the midst of horrible pain and suffering mm -hmm. and our solace is knowing that God is with us but he doesn't just fix it you know it's, yeah. it's something that's part of our life and we've got to go through it yeah, and uh, in a lot of Christian music, that that element seems to be missing. So, and there are some really great Christian musicians out there. There are some that I really enjoy, but at the same time, um, you know, there there's a lot that are that are very formulaic, 
And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, you even see the same thing in a lot of pop music, you know, where you've got a whole group of writers working with the artists going, how can we turn yeah. this into a hit? And so when I listen to music, I love music. I'm really a lot more interested in singer-songwriters yeah. than I am in what the uh, you know big companies are going to mm -hmm. pay radio stations to push into being number one hits. Well, and it just makes sense that they do that because, like I said before, there are different there are different um, ways to listen to music. But mm -hmm. the the most popular is just casually in your mm -hmm. car or whatever in the background. Mm -hmm. And the music that's produced the reason it's called pop music, popular mm -hmm. music is because it that's the probably the most popular way to listen to music yeah. is casually and that music um, from a technical standpoint is extremely cyclical yeah uh, it's it has, generic it's generic the melodies are catchy the hooks are uh, are compelling uh, and it, and it kind of runs in a circle for three to five minutes and then mm -hmm. it ends yeah and and it's very easy to listen to without paying attention to mm -hmm. but Bob Dylan, for instance, is not quite as easy to listen to and not pay attention to. Mm -hmm. He doesn't play it on time. <laughs> he doesn't necessarily play it in the same key all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a that is his thing, is. and he, and he does that purposely. It, there's a there's a yeah. brilliance to it. Somebody I know went to a Bob Dylan concert a few years ago, and they were noticing that he was playing all of his songs a little differently than they sound in his recordings. And after they got a little significantly into the concert, they realized, oh, he's doing a motif. He has changed every song on his set to fit a certain motif yeah. to make the things flow the way he wants them to for this yeah. specific concert. Yeah, and, and that's not necessarily, it was, it was a massive hit, especially in his day, in his heyday, mm -hmm. for sure. But it wasn't, and you may call it pop, but it wasn't the same way it, it wasn't consumed music wasn't consumed the same way it is today right it was uh it was a little more of a uh, i mean pro when when tvs weren't in every household or if they were they were very limited right uh, mm -hmm. music was very much a uh, an evening thing mm -hmm. um you had it in your car but it was something i mean people at the top of the music uh mountain in those days were as big as any movie star i mean mm -hmm. sinatra he was he might as well have been a multi-Oscar winning actor. He was oh, yeah. just as big. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a kind of a different world then, but it's still the singer-songwriter, uh, those, I found that those who are more interested have a more of an interest in music, looking for, uh, find themselves more moved by music, actually mm -hmm. do like that, like, they like a lot of music, mm -hmm. uh, but they find themselves being drawn to singer-songwriter music because mm -hmm. it's a little more, it's not necessarily background music. Yeah, and it's a challenge. It's a know, challenge. You're you looking to hear going, the message. How do they do this? Yeah. Wow, what, what are they doing there, and, and how do they get from there to here? Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's almost like a puzzle for a lot of, you know, a lot of really great songs to figure out mm -hmm. um, what's going on with all the different working parts in the song. Yeah, and I'll say as a musician, as a songwriter, um, there, are, there are, it's something hard to explain um, because a lot of it I don't understand even how I do it. Mm -hmm. But some, there are some songs I've written, for instance, that I wrote a song called Daniel. Um, it's not, it, that's not available anywhere, it's not up, but uh, it was a song I wrote for, uh, about the story of a little boy my mom worked with, my mom's a social worker, mm -hmm. and she worked with a kid named Daniel, he's five years old, and he was stuck in the system, his mom and dad were drug addicts, they were in prison, he went to live with his aunt, who didn't want him, she had a whole slew of kids of, on, uh, of mm -hmm. her own, Yeah. partly just didn't have the means to take care of him, and partly... This was a burden her sister should have taken mm -hmm. care of, type of thing. Right. She didn't really care for him. And then my mom went to pick him up. She picked him up like a couple days a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just played with him. And they started to bond. And he was apparently pretty feral. He's kind of a wild mm -hmm. kid. But they started to bond. And she went back to his house one day, like regular, just the next week to pick him up. And the lady came to the door and said, Oh, he died last night. Mm -hmm. And she was like, um, What? Yeah. She said, yeah, he went into a seizure, and I called the ambulance, they took him to 
the hospital and he died there. Sorry. Just kind of like that. And, mm -hmm. and she had to go back to work. Yeah, it's not often until after I've written the song and I've gotten to listen to it over and over and recorded it even that I understand where maybe this stems from. Something mm -hmm. I've heard, something someone said to me. Sometimes I don't know at all. I, we're getting ready to release a song called Birdhouse. Yeah. I have no clue. I, I have no clue what the meaning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I like the song. There's some sort of a story there, but I don't know. I don't know what it is. And you know, it's interesting that you mention that about meaning because songs, unlike many other forms of art, can take on numerous meanings for different people. Um, I heard Brooks and Dunn, the country singers, in, a, in an interview a while back where uh, they were explaining about their song Neon Moon, which is about basically someone being sad and heartbroken and in a bar drinking uh, because the person they loved is no longer loving them. And they said, people come to us all the time and say, we played that song and danced to it at our wedding. And they're going, um, that's, yeah. <laughs> this is not a wedding song, you know? And so, uh, but they said, you know, they said, you know, people have just taken it and they've made it their own. Yeah. They just love it. And, uh, you know, you two is kind of the same way. They've said, look, you know, we write a song and we have a specific meaning or intention in mind with it. It gets out there to the public and then they do things with it that we would have never thought of and then it brings on new meaning. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'll tell you, as, as a relatively new songwriter, a couple of years, I've been at it a couple, three years maybe, mm -hmm. um, that is some of the most exciting feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, I love when people hear the song it, it, because I want to know what you hear. Mm -hmm. I know what I hear. I wrote it. Um, even if I don't necessarily have like a concrete, here's, here's the meaning. I know what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. But uh, that so much of it is an internal process. Hearing a melody that doesn't actually exist. Yeah. Coming up with a chord progression that doesn't exist. Lyrics that in their order have never existed before. That's, that's the thing that's so exciting about writing music to me, is painting, and this is not a, uh, to discount anything about other ways of producing art, but painting, uh, digital media, things like that, they're pretty concrete. There, there, are, there are colors you can use, there are brushes you can use, and there is a uh, a palette or a, a, a canvas you can use mm -hmm. and you can use different kinds of those but they're concrete and they're there and you can look at it and say this is the one I'm gonna use and you take it from here and you put it there. It's almost yeah. like stickers mm -hmm. uh, in a way. In a way, yeah. Um, that. But that's not that's not the case with music. With music there it's it's a hundred percent imagination mm -hmm. until you bring it down to your instrument, and then your pen, and yeah. then you, and then the melody, and it's that is so exciting to me. Yeah, you know, when you paint something, you sort of have to have a vision in your head of what you're putting on on the canvas, right? It, you've got to be heading towards something. Yeah. And in music, you sort of start going, and you're like, this could end up anywhere. Yes, and so, songs often do. You, I'm writing a song right now. Um, that I put a little clip up online, mm -hmm. but uh, I, Jürgen Moltmann tells a story of um, a concentration camp in World War II where they were doing public hangings and they would have all the Jews come out and force them to watch uh, them hang people every mm -hmm. day. And they would hang women and men and young kids and one day they were hanging a young boy and someone in the crowd, deathly silent, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And there was a man in the crowd who yelled, where is God? And then in an answer, another man somewhere else in the crowd yelled, he's on the gallows. Mm -hmm. And that story captivated me. Yeah. And then it brought forth an image. I'll, I'll actually do this to you. I've done this to a few friends, but I'll see what you think. All right. I want you to imagine Jesus, being crucified, mm -hmm. nails in his hands, 
people there watching, obviously scoffing, laughing, mocking, uh, raised up high, hanging his head, dying. Mm -hmm. Okay, now imagine Jesus hanging from a noose, arms tied around his back, writhing, struggling for air, people surrounding the tree he's hanging from. It's deathly quiet, other than a little chatter, and people mocking and smirking and pointing and laughing and mm -hmm. flipping him off. And Of those two images, which is more disturbing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that for a lot of people today, probably the hanging would be more disturbing. I can see that as being more disturbing, partially because it's more real, because you have some uh, symbols. I mean, I mean, I saw Saddam Hussein get hanged a few years ago. I know what that really looks like. Yeah. You've got an image of the cross, but nobody's really seen anybody get crucified. There, and that was, that was, so hearing this story, I was, I was actually brushing my teeth. My wife and I were getting ready for bed. And I said, I've got tattoos on me. I've got Soren Kierkegaard right here. You got tattoos mm -hmm. all over. Um, I said, I, as a sort of a, to test, I, I wasn't sure about this, but I wanted to test this theory I had. Mm -hmm. Because I find the noose far more disturbing for exactly the reason you just said, I think. Mm -hmm. And I said, Ray, I'm thinking about getting a tattoo of Jesus it, hanging from a noose mm -hmm. tattooed on me. And her immediate reaction was, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. That's gross. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. knew I had her. And I go, why don't you feel that way about the image of him on a cross? And she just looked at me like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, and and I think know. it's, I think not to interrupt you, oh, but I think it's exactly what you said. Hanging is very American. Mm -hmm. That's a very American thing. That was the preferred form of execution for a long time. Um, I mean, we don't even have to begin talking about the Jim Crow area just hanging black people right. for no reason. Um, people who are still alive today who may have been in attendance for some of those hangings. I mean, not that long ago. So it's very, very close to us. It's very, very near to our culture. But there's also sort of a romanticization of the crucifixion. Yeah. Uh, and that maybe comes after 2,000 years of veneration, of acknowledging it, and trying to give it a pr its proper place. But eventually it turns yeah. into jewelry. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, the, the cross itself, in a sense, we've been sort of, in some respects, desensitized yeah. to the nature of what really took place. And probably because, like you said, no one's seen or even known someone who's been crucified for mm -hmm. hundreds of years, at this, at least in the Western world. Right. Um, it was, never, it was never an option in America. You yeah. Know? I mean, people came over here originally to, to escape religious persecution. Right. They're not going to put people to death that way. Right, exactly. So, so I just found this story. So, so this was a side trail, but sorry about that. But it's all right. <laughs> uh, going back, I'm writing this song called God on the Gallows, mm. and I'm trying to find myself in sitting with a black woman in Jim Crow era, the Jim Crow era South, watching her son hang. Mm -hmm. And I have written, over the course of a, few, of a couple of weeks, I've written like a line mm -hmm. every week. And the song started out completely different oh, than yeah. it is now. And it's sort of taking shape. But some songs I, I can write, so I have a song online right now it's called, uh, it's by far our highest stream song. It's called Smoke and Blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote that song and recorded it in about three hours. Mm -hmm. It's written, recorded, done, three hours. And this one's taking weeks. Um, and I can't explain how that happens. It just happens that way. But it is the case that oftentimes you get a, you get a, a spark of an idea and, and you sort of just chase it. Until yeah. you reach well, sort of an end point. When you're doing it yourself, you know, you're in the studio, you've got, okay, this is how I want it to sound. Um, you know, it may come out pretty close to what you intended. Uh, once you bring a band into it, it's, okay, mm -hmm. now it's, you know, uh, John Mellencamp a few years ago was asked, you know, do, you, do the songs you write ever, when you record them, do they ever sound the way you thought they would? 
And he said, absolutely not. Because once the band and I start playing it together, it always morphs into something different. Yeah. And, um, and one of the nice things about music is that you can take the same song, two different people can sing it in a different way, a different manner, mm-hmm. and it can almost sound like a completely different song. I mean, it has a completely different purpose just because of the way you sing the lyrics. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another exciting part of music. And that's also true, kind of what he's saying about bringing it with the live band to, to record it in the studio. Mm-hmm. That is also true live. Mm-hmm. So depending on um, depending on who's playing with you, songs will have a different sort of color mm-hmm. to them. It's still the song. It's still even even post the pr- the production of it. It's written, recorded. Everybody listens to it. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got the got the song in their mind and we all pick up our instruments and if people picking up the instruments are not the same people who recorded it it's going to have a different color it's going to have a different flavor yeah and uh, and that is interesting even if it's as simple as just the way that the guitar is yeah. tuned or even the way that uh, you've got a different amount of distortion exactly and i do that intentionally actually show to show uh, we recently played in nashville and when we were at the nashville show I completely changed my the effect on my guitar so that the guitar actually it has a very recognizable riff in the song, uh, but I completely changed the effect live, and it just keeps it fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that l- little nuance actually affects everybody else playing, maybe even not even subconsciously. Mm-hmm. Like they'll they'll pick up on the way this sounds being manipulated and and do do whatever they do on the bass or on the drums that actually matches what is now being done whether they realize it or not and i like that there's a sort of a, a sneakiness on my part doing that yeah, but, sure. but it's fun and and people who listen live get kind of a fresh version and yeah. uh I mean, there are artists I know who have, they've recorded songs live and then they write another verse and they sing an additional verse when they play it live. Yeah. And people become really enamored with that. And it's like, almost like, hey, the recorded version's good, but unless you've heard it live, you've really never heard the song. And we actually are releasing, uh, we've already done this in the past. I wrote a song called Tin Can Blues, which Mm -hmm. is another example of a song not about God and not even about a person who probably knows God. But uh, I find it's a great song. It's called Tin Can Blues. It's essentially about a guy who has everything. He's mm-hmm. got, the first verse is, he's got more money, I've got more money than a bank, more time the sun's got shine, mm-hmm. a thousand pairs of brand new shoes, but still I sing the Tin Can Blues. And the whole song's about him having no friends. Mm-hmm. He has everything in the world and no friends. And, talk, and then later another verse talks about uh, um, liquor helps my sour mood, but I still sing the Tin Can Blues. Mm-hmm. I don't. That's not my life. I have wonderful friends. Yeah, and I don't know where the song came from. And the, you know, there are people I've heard uh, you know, in conversations. They'll say, "I want to know why the person sang this song. What were they going through in their life that made them feel this way?" And I'm going, "Well, maybe they never felt that way. Maybe they were just." coming up with something creative and wondering what would it be like to be in this position that's you know? exactly it uh, in a sense I mean musicians are actors and um, you know just because you've seen something doesn't mean it's always yeah. first person perspective you kind of take the character into the song you mm-hmm. imagine a character and you know when it comes to the character um, I don't know if it's a story I heard or maybe it's a, a combination of stories and people I know and things I've heard and it kind of comes together with and creates this character in my mind and I think he has a story and I play the story but to go back to the Tin Can Blues I wrote the song originally as a sort of a bluegrass just Mm -hmm. me on an acoustic Tin Can Bluesy sounding song sure Um, and my wife hated it she (laughs) hated it I really liked it other people really liked it it just wasn't her vibe yeah which I totally respected, and so I said, then you uh, rewrite the music. Mm-hmm. And we released Tin Can Blues in a two-song uh, EP, essentially. Mm-hmm. It's the exact same song, same verses, same mm-hmm. structure, with completely different music. And she wrote this very fast, very punk, uh, mm-hmm. fast and hard rock song, 
and and I wrote this very bluegrassy, kind of slowed down, twangy, yeah. acoustic only blues song. And but it's the same song, and it has a, a completely different feel. And she mm -hmm. even sings the second song. I mean, so it, completely different feel. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to like what you're saying, where you know, just changing parts of the song, everything else remaining the same, but you're just tweaking some things mm -hmm. or completely changing the music. It has a completely different. I mean, I mean, it's literally saying the same thing, and yet you're not hearing it the same way. Yeah. And I love it. I yeah, no, that's great. I love and, that. Uh, I think you know, growing up, I was told on a number of occasions, like you know, you shouldn't be listening to rock music or you shouldn't be listening to this because it's of the devil or yeah. you know, whatever else. And and granted, there are some pretty bad musicians out there that probably are worshiping the devil, but most of them aren't. Um, you know, um, I was told one time that Led Zeppelin was backmasking some stuff in a live song. I'm like, you can't backmask in a live song. It, wow. Backmasking is when you record something and then play it on the album backwards. You can't do that live. Yeah. It's just not possible. And uh, so, uh, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, you don't need to listen to this or you don't need to listen to that. Um, and for a number of years, I thought, uh, you know, this is, uh, I thought either I'm going to be, you know, I'm being sinful and listening to the secular music, or um, people don't have a really good understanding of um, the true meaning and beauty of music in and of itself. Yeah. And um, I think the whole purpose of what we're kind of talking about today is really that uh, music is a way of thinking about the world and engaging the world and conversing with people from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different educational levels, different ethnicities, genders, so on and so on. Um, you know, there are songs that are written from female perspe uh, perspectives that I could never in a million years have understood that the way that I do after hearing that song. We had once, this actually happened, mm -hmm. we were playing a show in Denton, it was just me and my wife, we didn't have a drummer. And before we went on, I said to the crowd, I said, if any, there was a drum set behind us. I said, if anybody plays the drums, <laughs> you're welcome to come on yeah. stage. And somebody did. Awesome. And he was the best drummer I've ever played with. Wow. It was insane. Had never heard our music. <laughs> and, and he's like, what's the thing? And I was like, just follow me. I'm going to play it once around. And that's the other thing about our songs, which you probably have told. They're cyclical. Mm -hmm. They're sort of a, a bluesiness to them. Uh, but... They're, they're, they run in a cycle, so that's what I told them. I was like, mm -hmm. it just runs in a cycle, and I will, I'll give mm -hmm. you cues on the dynamics. And it was one of the craziest, most exciting. He never heard any of it. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah. yeah. All right. So when it comes to looking at music and looking at the uh, the way we interpret songs and finding meaning, you know, it's not that there's just one meaning to a song, but rather that we engage it and converse with it and explore meanings in songs. And by doing that, we're able to better enjoy art, but we're also able to better understand our culture, we're better able to understand our society. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, people saying, well, you shouldn't be listening to this kind of art. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, there are lots of people living in our culture with different perspectives. And because these people have different perspectives, uh, it's important for us to try to understand people and understand them from their perspectives in as much as we can. Because the more we engage our culture and understand where they're coming from, the easier we can build a bridge to the gospel uh, as we go about our life and share the Great Commission, but also the more easily we can meet people's needs. And there are a lot of needs in our society. And those needs are typically highlighted in the music that we listen to in our culture. And so it's important for us as Christians not to seclude ourselves or segregate ourselves out, or uh, as is often done with especially some contemporary Christian music, uh, make a cheap imitation of other stuff that's already out there in the culture, mm -hmm. uh, or a Christianized version of it. Instead, we, we look at art and we say, okay, there's good art and there's bad art. Let me focus on the good art, no matter who has created it, and let me engage it, and let me use that to further the gospel, to further God's kingdom, and to become a better person. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, all of that's spot on. I just, I think it's important for people to hear that you shouldn't be afraid of art. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't scare you. Even art that, unless that's what its intention is. And then let it, let <laughs> sure. it be scary. But, but being afraid of somebody's music who's not a Christian mm -hmm. is just something I'm not concerned with. Right. I don't think anyone should be concerned. And I think that's where it comes from is this is going to lead me down a path. This music is going to lead me down. This Led Zeppelin song is going to lead me down this path. Or this Black Sabbath song is going to lead me down this path. But that's... No. Mm -hmm. That won't happen. Right. So... Music doesn't create monsters. Yeah. Uh, every human is capable of great good, and every human is capable of vile evil. And music tends to bring about certain emotions in, in us that reveal our heart's character and nature, but it doesn't turn us into something we're not. Yeah, yes, exactly. And so, if I could, you know, listen to music. It's yeah. a great thing. It's a magical thing. It's a, it's fantastic. I love it. And mm -hmm. if you, I encourage everybody, if you have any kind of a creative bone in your body, to try to make music. Mm -hmm. I wrote a, we did a song, um, which we haven't released yet, called uh, Bear Ringer. And uh, I just got on my software and made noises with different, like, objects. Like, I had a guitar, and I turned the, the delay um, completely up. Mm -hmm. And the chorus, which a chorus effect on a guitar uh, causes the sound to, to oscillate in and out of tune, just very, very slightly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't actually play the guitar, I just like poked the, poked the string and then poked the pickup. Mm -hmm. And it made a very weird like crack sound mm -hmm. over and over again. And then the delay, I just layered it and it makes this weird effect. It's just weird and getting, getting weird with it. And I people should do that people should if you are creative if you like music if you want to write music you should just try try it experiment yeah. have fun there's no wrong way to do it you know you think about artists who have big hits and obviously you know not everybody's going to become a world famous musician but I mean, you look at guys like say george harrison from the beatles during the time the beatles were together from 1965 to, I mean, they were together before that, but from 1965 to 1969, he wrote hundreds of songs that he never recorded. And um, every artist who really loves music tends to write more than they record, and they tend to not share everything they write. Um, and they also, uh, you know, they they do it they do it so much that it becomes second nature to them and they become good at it because of the repetition. Yeah. And so if you try your hand at music, you love it, you want to write it, um, go for it. And if the first song you write doesn't turn out great, don't worry about the, that. The first song is not always great. <laughs> it's can, not going to be great. At, <laughs> but it's but like everything right, else. So, yeah. You get better. You get you find your voice. You get you get better at your instrument. You get better singing. Whatever it is mm -hmm. that you're doing, you get better. It's a craft. You get you become a better artist. Uh, Prince, yeah. when he died, had a safe in his house, and he had over a thousand pieces of material, whether it's a little cassette or it was a notebook, of over a thousand different songs mm -hmm. no one had ever heard. Mm -hmm. And some of them were just lyrics uh, of songs and obviously no music, so you can't, don't really know what he was thinking there, but yeah. a thousand, one thousand, mm -hmm. completely mysterious, pieces of music from one of the most influential musicians in American culture in the, of the 20th century. Yeah. And just, and it's safe. And uh, I think that's pretty common. I mean, most artists, when they put together an album, they, they actually, they write this, this big number of songs, 20, 30, sometimes 40, mm -hmm. and they pick 12. And I've always wondered what the heck happens. Because yeah. uh, as a music lover, I want to know what you thought wasn't a good fit mm -hmm. and why and why yes and, uh, or is it going to show up on something it, else yeah you know? exactly uh, I, I always enjoy going to live concerts where bands say hey we're trying this song out let us know yes. what you think and then you know their next album comes out and it's not on there and I go but I liked the song when I saw them live 
what happened and yeah. where can I get that song? Yeah, so. we went to see the Rack and Tours in Nashville. My wife and I did, uh, and they did that. They were there in the middle of producing the album, and they said, "We're thinking about putting this song on the album. When we get done playing it, you let us know." You know, mm -hmm. and, and that's cool. Yeah, I love that because you're like a part of it. Then you know, it's, sm it's a small way. You're like a part of the the process. That's what we're trying to do online is with my wife and I with a red arrow mm -hmm. uh, trying to bring people into the songwriting process because I think to date that's still a sort of a hidden thing from people and even mm -hmm. if you're not creatively inclined or you're not necessarily interested in writing music but you love music it can be like an interesting thing to see so yeah. one of the things we've done is created a poll um, for people to vote on the album art for the song to release. I just mm -hmm. thought this is kind of a neat way to get people to have kind of a part in it. And then we're also, we'll do videos occasionally showing how we record certain parts of the song um, mm -hmm. and, and, and remove some parts. And some of them are flops, man. I mean, some of them are really duds. Mm -hmm. And some of it's good. And um, but typically, when you think of music and artists, you really only get the cream of the crop of their release. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes the stuff, it, it's just, in, to me, it's just interesting seeing the, the, the inner workings of someone's mind whenever they're trying to find the best fit for a certain song. And that process, to me, is interesting. And so if you're, if you're interested in that, you can, you can follow us online and... Kind of tune in while yeah, we write I'll, I'll music. Yeah, I'll put a video, or not a video, I'll put a link, rather, on our yeah. video awesome. to uh, some of your stuff. So some awesome. of your podcasts as well as uh, Red Arrow. So Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for being here today, Ross. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. I loved it. So uh, Yeah, I loved it. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. All right, we'll see you next time.